In this video, I want to help you understand the full spectrum of public equity investment styles. And please note this discussion only limits to fundamental, bottom-up stock picking type of investing, which does not include styles such as global macro. And uh, there are always exceptions in this profession, so this is an attempt to generalize, but not a perfect one. And also, by the way, I brought my friend Ryan the Lion. Ryan, say hi. If you're new to my channel, my name is Richard Toad. I am a ex hedge fund research analyst and a ex sell side equity research associate. When you begin your career in public equity investing, also known as the buy side, either you will excel or you will struggle. And a big driver of that outcome is due to your alignment with your firm's investment style. And therefore, it is very important that you know your personal investment style, which should help you narrow down your job search targets. Yes, your opportunity set will be smaller than if you want to be everything for everyone. But if you can get a clear sense of your style, you will tell a more convincing story, have more tailored stock pitches, and most importantly, have the best chance of landing the job. So what are the equity investment styles out there? There are two dimensions to think about. One, are you a long only or a long short investor? Two, what flavor of investor are you interested in becoming? The big difference between long only and long short investment style is the involvement of shorting. At first glance, shorting is the mirror image of buying a stock or long a stock. In reality, shorting has a lot of unique nuances, such as its infinite loss potential versus where your maximum loss for a long position is 100% of your invested capital. Additionally, Short sellers need to pay attention to things like catalyst, liquidity, market flow, and it's much more path dependent than a long only investing. Some of the unique issues associated with shorting manifested themselves during the GameStop fiasco. Long only, very straightforward, they spend 100% of their time on identifying and buying undervalued stocks. When the rest of the market agrees with their assessment and the stock goes up, they will sell the stock. When the overall market is relatively more expensive, long onlys can choose to stay in cash. Most mutual funds are long onlys. Some brand names here are Fidelity, Wellington, and Franklin Templeton. Mutual funds typically lean more toward a buy and hold mentality. And moving on to long short, a long short fund effectively is running two portfolios at the same time. A long portfolio or a long book, it is a portfolio of stocks that is similar to a long only mutual fund, which is buying low and selling high. There's also a short book where the fund is borrowing stocks and selling them for cash first, and then buying the stock back at a lower price, known as closing the short, to generate a profit. Majority of the hedge funds out there are long short funds, and comparing to mutual funds, hedge funds lean more toward opportunistic trading mentality. Within the hedge fund land, there are two main types, single manager and multi-manager. A single manager hedge fund is one where Final buy and sell decision is decided usually by a sole portfolio manager. A multi-manager hedge fund is a platform that hosts many, many portfolio managers who are running their autonomous strategy. To better understand long short investing, you should be familiar with some terminologies. Let's use a single manager hedge fund as an example. In this example, Toad Capital manages 500 million. It has 300 million or 60% long positions and 200 million or 40% short positions. 
the gross exposure sums a fund's long and short positions in dollar or percentage terms. In this case, the gross exposure is $300 million of long exposure plus $200 million of short exposure, which in total is $500 million. And then the fund has a 100% gross exposure. You must be wondering what is the point of knowing a fund has 100% gross exposure or have dollar gross exposure equal to its asset under management. That is because some hedge funds employ leverage, so a fund can borrow money to have more than 100% gross exposure. The other concept is net exposure which is the difference between a fund's long exposure and short exposure. A long short portfolio manager has the responsibility and flexibility to adjust net exposure based on what her view of the forward market condition. If she is more bearish about the market outlook, she can reduce the net exposure. In this example, the fund has a $100 million net exposure or 20% net exposure. The introduction of net exposure is a good segue into a special type of longshore hedge fund called market neutral, which a lot of you know are called multi-manager or pod shops. The most famous ones are Citadel, Millennium, and Point72. By definition, market neutral means zero net exposure and a market neutral portfolio's price movement should have no correlation with the daily broad market movements. As a result, a market neutral fund depends 100% on company specific events to generate returns. And one of those company specific events being quarterly earning outcomes exceeding or missing expectations. Why are multi-manager hedge funds also called pod shops? That's because these firms provide a platform for many, many portfolio managers to run their portfolio autonomously. And each portfolio run by each portfolio manager is called a pod. While the autonomy is great and pod shops provide the quickest path for someone to manage money. Another key feature of pot shop is risk limits. When a portfolio manager joins a multi-manager platform, they contractually agree that their portfolio value will not decline more than certain percentage over a defined period. If they breach risk limits, the portfolio manager and her junior analysts are dismissed from the firm. It is not personal, it's just contractual. Why does a pot shop impose risk limits? The reason is these funds employ heavy leverage. Each portfolio manager is allocated capital that is already levered. So if the portfolio manager loses 5% on the portfolio, it is actually 20% loss to the multi-manager platform, assuming it is four times levered. In such model, risk control is paramount. So in a multi-manager model, the entire pod team needs to constantly worry about every single stock movement, regardless of whether it's driven by the business fundamental or other technical or macro drivers. Finally, another feature of a longshore fund that you should be aware of is that the short book positions are turning over much more quickly than the long book. So the junior research analysts at a longshore fund tend to spend relatively much more time on researching short ideas because a fund can have the same multi-year time horizon on its long book, just like a mutual fund, but must have more a catalyst driven short book that has more positions than the long book because you don't want to size your short positions very big to avoid any big blow up like what we saw during the GameStop fiasco. Of course, 
hedge funds also pay way more attention on incremental data points and quarterly results even for the long positions versus a mutual fund. With the long only and long short discussion out of the way, let's discuss the other dimension which is investment style. Conceptually, when you buy a stock, you get paid in three ways. Dividend stock buyback, which are a return of capital, earnings growth, which is more fundamental, and valuation multiple expansion, which is more of a sentiment liquidity situation. Every fund claims that they invest just a little bit differently from the other funds out there because an investment fund as a business needs to differentiate. In my opinion, most stock picking funds fall into one of the genres. This style generally focuses on buying 50 cent dollars. Deep value is very much a dividend stock buyback play because the cash flows generated by this business are really better off coming back to the investors than staying within the business as the investor themselves can allocate that capital to more value creating businesses. The original Benjamin Graham is a deep value investor. I consider Carl Icahn to be a deep value investor, but he's also many other things like an activist. Traditional value investing is rooted in the idea of mean reversion. Businesses can have short term issues and the bet here is by owning them during their troubled times and gaining conviction of the business's ability to revert back to normality, traditional value investors can get paid on the reversion to a more normalized free cash flow generating cadence and the corresponding multiple expansion. Some of the legendary traditional value investors include Leon Cooperman of Omega Advisors and Seth Klarman of Baupost. Two subgenres of value investing that deserve their own sections. One of them is activism. They receive a lot of media publicity, but to me it is really just a form of value investing. Activists are truly private equity approach to the public market. They conduct deep diligence and put out very detailed presentation during an activist campaign. And most of them invest very concentrated. If you think about Pershing Square Capital when Bill Ackman was still an activist, they don't own more than 10 stock positions at a time. And that is why these funds tend to favor hiring candidates with elite private equity experiences. Activists take large stakes in public companies to become a top shareholder to try to influence strategic decision of that company because they disagree with the company's capital allocation, management quality, or want to agitate for value creation through events such as a spinoff or an asset sale. Activists can get paid across all three dimensions. I'm sure you know an activist or two, but Daniel Loeb of Third Point and Paul Singer of Elliott Management come to my mind. The discussion of event as a way to catalyze value is a great lead in into the next subgenre that is called special situation. Special situation, another name for this style is event driven. It is an investment style that relies on company specific events as catalysts to drive investment return. Aside from quarterly earning beats and misses, many events can move the stock price of a company. Example includes a spin-off, asset sale, or a conglomerate where the value of each individual parts is worth more than all of them combined within one entity. The beauty of special situation investing is the return is uncorrelated with the broader stock market performance as the focus is on company specific events. 
most hedge funds like to invest with an event, i.e. a catalyst in mind, and that is particularly true for market neutral investors. Special situation investors focus mostly on multiple expansion. Some of the high profile special situation investors include Davidson Kempner Capital Management and Faradon Capital Management. Now onto the growth arena. First, let's talk about GARP investing, which stands for growth at a reasonable price. GARP investors are looking to buy businesses with above market growth without overpaying. A variant style under this genre is the wide mode investing. Wide mode investors are looking for businesses with sustainable competitive advantages that can continue to grow moderately while paying a reasonable multiple for the business. Well, with a good business, you are unlikely paying an abysmally low multiple, but wide mode investors understand the quality of the business provides investor with the same margin of safety that traditional value investors find in a stock's statistical cheapness. And GARP investors mostly get paid on earnings growth without worrying about multiple expansion. The pioneer of this genre will be Peter Lynch, who ran Fidelity Magellan Fund, which was once the biggest mutual fund in the world. Of course, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger are the most famous quality slash wide mode investors. Finally, there is hyper growth investing. Well, they invest in publicly traded high growth companies. There's no confusion here. These businesses have enormous addressable market. They are disruptors and on the right end of paradigm shift. For example, think e-commerce disrupting brick and mortar retail. Hyper growth companies tend to be unprofitable at the moment because they should span to grow as quickly as possible to establish a first mover advantage and dominate in a typically winner take all industry. But a sensible hyper growth investor is nevertheless a value investor. Well, any sensible investor should be a value investor, which is focusing on buying stake in a business at a price that is lower than what the business is worth. A hyper growth investor is focusing on paying a reasonable multiple on the business's long-term earning power when it does scale to profitability. If they're right, they will generate handsome compounded return over the investment horizon and also gets paid on the associated multiple expansion as the market agrees with the investor's assessment. Most, if not all of the Tiger Cub hedge funds who are not macro investors fall into this genre. Some of the venture capital funds with public investing arms are called crossover funds. They naturally fall under this genre as well. Crossover funds have the benefit of extending their ownership of the private company they finance when they go public. There is no right or wrong way to investing. An investment management business needs to make money for clients. That is the same goal whether you're trading quarters or thinking five years out what a business can become. For you, however, you should be very clear on what situations resonate with how you invest, which will help you narrow the list of funds to work for so that you can thrive in that environment and enjoy the longevity in the profession. Punchlines up front, the grass is always greener, not just as a career coach. I personally, from friends or anecdotally, I hear a lot of folks want to move across investment styles. But I tell you this right now, like everything else in life, it's really about the trade-off. I am not a hypocrite. We're all in this business to make big money. I just want to remind you, 
without the ability to add value on the job as a junior research person, the million dollar bonus is just a mirage. Make sure you find a philosophically aligned firm, even if it means if that firm pays a lot less than another shop. Just to be clear, most junior analysts won't be making million dollar bonuses anyways. The other thing is, many on finance forums start their question thread or do a coaching session with me telling me that their ultimate goal is to start a hedge fund. Good for you. To those types, please know what it takes to start a hedge fund, especially in 2022 and beyond. The back office costs, the legal complexity of setting up a hedge fund or any legal structure for an investment fund. How difficult it is to raise money even when you have a good track record coming from a very brand name fund. Also, have fun explaining to your investors after your first drawdown as you for sure will have one. Again, everyone wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That's the problem here. I will try my best to list the pros and cons of each path without bringing my personal view on trading versus investing, although most of my audience know where I stand on that issue, but that is not within the scope. I just want to advise you to think really hard about what you sign up for in this profession. And I think about it in five dimensions. Job security, work-life balance, speed to glory, which is how quickly you will become a portfolio manager, pay. Pay is on average better at a hedge fund because hedge funds are a 2 and 20 model and mutual funds charges a flat fee on the asset under management. For charging a higher fee, there comes the lifestyle trade-off because you're, you need to add more value, not just similarly to mutual fund on the long term, you also need to pay attention to any events and quarterly results. Finally, stress. Please know my assessment of the lifestyle are relative within the three styles. So for example, when I discuss lifestyle working at a multi-manager, that is in relation to long only or single manager hedge funds. So for multi-manager pot shops, the pros, it is really the only true meritocracy. You eat what you kill. That's particularly true for the portfolio manager him or herself. It is pure alpha because it's beta neutral, which means if S&P is up 20% or down 20% for the year, pot shop should make money. There's some tailwind where capital is flowing into this style that is particularly true as we speak right now in late 2022. You get access to abundance of resources in terms of alternative data, sell side access. Finally, it is the fastest path to wealth and responsibility, i.e. managing a book for those who are skilled. But that's the key point here is you need to be skilled. Relatively, there's most number of job openings in multi-manager world. Well, there's a reason I'll get into that which leads into the cons. It is relatively the highest stress way of investing. It relatively has the poorest work-life balance. I don't know the exact number, but say 65 hour weekly on a normal days, and uh, you can get into 80 hours or even worse during earning seasons. It is the poorest job security because of risk limits. The entire portfolio team is let go if we breach the risk limits. No es personal, it's just contractual. Finally, stock price in the short run is always going to be more random than what the company is worth over time. So this style is very prone to short-term randomness. That's not really your fault, but if you blow up, you're let go even when that's not your fault. Contrasting multi-managers, we have long onlys. The pros, best stability, best lifestyle, very straightforward, very long-term focus on the business, and lowest relative stress. Not as much worry about quarterly earnings 
every incremental data point that don't matter five years out, things like that. Cons, relative lowest compensation, stagnant or declining asset growth because many mutual funds don't really add any value throughout the cycle. And it takes the longest time to become a portfolio manager because the PMs won't leave. Well, why would they? Right. And, and which also drives the issue of there's so few job openings because all of the pros. And then you have the single manager hedge fund that are sandwiched between the two. And the pros are it is relatively better stability than pawn shops slash multi manager at the right lineage, i.e. a tiger cub. Single manager hedge funds are still a great launch pad to start your own fund after you establish a strong track record for yourself at these single managers. Still very good money and it's better bonus than long only at the same experience level. The investment style can be more long term than a pot shop. That's particularly true on the long side. Cons. There are less openings than pot shop openings. There's slim chance of you becoming a portfolio manager because by definition, a single manager shop has one portfolio manager, which is usually the founder. It is not truly long term investing as a claim because the investor capital is not as long duration as a mutual fund. Lifestyle is very dependent on the fund. No one can generalize. It can be a 35 to 40 hour work week or a 80 hour per week lifestyle depends on the founder and his or her lineage. So my advice is to know the founder, do diligence on where they came from and how they run the shop. My theory here is these founders are able to start their own shop because they succeeded at their old shops. So it's highly likely, in my opinion, that they will take a big part of their old shops process to build their own firm. Right. Prime example will be how Julian Robertson was able to groom so many successful hedge fund managers out of Tiger management because Robertson's process and eyes for talent. Again, there's no right way. Reality is offers are really hard to come by in this profession. So you cannot really afford to choose when you are presented with opportunity to break into the profession. But if a firm does not resonate at all with your personal philosophy, I advise you to think really hard and be willing to say no if necessary. Please like this video, subscribe and hit the bell icon for future contents. More resources on my website and on my Instagram. I talk to you next time. Peace.